I remember when I was on the farm one day, we were driving into town. I was riding my uncle. Um, we were going into Byron, and uh, he had the radio on, they had the news on. And this was back in 62, 63, so I was 12 or 13 years old. But this always stuck out in my mind. They came on, they said the 101st, the 101st advisor in Vietnam had been killed. And I thought, first I thought, wow, 101 guys. Where the heck's Vietnam? Now mind you, you know, Vietnam, some far off land, I never even imagined what would come of that. When I graduated from high school, I did, I wanted to go to college and, uh, and major in draft division. I just wanted to stay in school so I didn't get drafted. And I remember sitting around the radio with my friends, waiting to hear the dates as they pulled the number. The Draft Lottery, a live report on tonight's picking of the birth dates for the draft. Tonight, for the first time in uh, 27 years, the United All States has again third. started a draft lottery. Six, and the famous one. first pick tonight April is September 28th. 14th, the first birthday that now is designated 001, which means for 19-year-olds born on September 14th, at beginning uh, in January, September local draft boards nine. will induct those men. I was entered in the first year of the uh, lottery system. I didn't want to go to Vietnam. My brother was there. He had written me letters, and he said it, it was no place to be. He, you know, he didn't like it at all. And he kept writing me and said, whatever you do, don't go in the military, and if you do, go in the Air Force. And where I won't go to Vietnam. Second night I was there, I almost overdosed on heroin. The friend I was with, uh, if I want you want to call him, we came over together, we trained together. Uh, he was from LA, and he said, "Oh, he says, he says, you just snorted a little bit of this, you know." Now, mind you, I I drank, and uh, I I mean I knew what heroin was, but you know I. You're 21 years old. You're in Vietnam. You're in a war. You know, there isn't a lot to do other than drink. And uh, so, so he said, you know, I've done this before. Nothing to it. Well, his whole problem was was that in L.A. it was cut so many times that it was a lot weaker. This was not cut, and I just remember it was the worst thing I'd ever gone through. I was a gunner on AC-130 gunships. I'm not going to go much into it because it wasn't uh, it wasn't all it was cracked up to be. It was well, it was a war. And so tonight, to you, the great silent majority of my fellow Americans, I ask for your support. I pledged in my campaign for the presidency to end the war in a way that we could win the peace. I have initiated a plan of action which will enable me to keep that pledge. The more support I can have from the American people, the sooner that pledge can be redeemed. For the more divided we are at home, the less likely the enemy is to negotiate at Paris. Let us be united for peace. Let us also be united against defeat. Because let us understand 
North Vietnam cannot defeat or humiliate the United States. Only Americans can do that. When I went over there, I thought, well, you know, I'm going to give it my best shot and see what we can do. Uh, but you quickly find out that they had no desire to win it. It was just, it was all Vietnamization. I mean, it was all going to be, we we're going to, it's a fancy way of turning it, you know, backing out slowly. Just like, a lot like what they did in Iraq. I mean, uh, and Iraq went the same way as Vietnam as far as it didn't take long for it to collapse. You can go over there, you can win the territory, but you can't win the hearts and minds of people. And, you know, I mean, if they don't, they don't want to, they don't want it. I changed jobs. I, I, I stopped flying. Because we weren't, uh, see what happened is, they had pulled all the uh, army out, but Vietnam was gonna make their, they were gonna show they could do this. They could, they could take the fight to the enemy. They uh, invaded a little bit of North Vietnam and into Laos and Cambodia up by Quang Tri province, which is Northern Vietnam. I don't know how many divisions had moved in there. Well, they got their asses kicked and they got in trouble, and we were flying round-the-clock missions to support them so they could bail out of there. And, uh, and we lost people that we should never have lost because they, they didn't know what they were doing. You know, and, and so I, I, didn't wanna, I didn't wanna fly anymore. And so I told them I didn't wanna fly anymore, and they said, well, if you think you're going to leave Vietnam, you're not. So that's when I got put on a load crew. When you're on a load crew, there's four guys. You each have a, have a job. And you do that for 12 hours. Or, you know, granted, you don't, you don't, you're not doing it constantly. But I mean, you'll load two aircraft, and then you may wait for a half hour, hour or so before you load more. Unless you work the nights. If you work nights, there was one load crew and they would load roughly 30 aircraft during the night for the next day's missions. The day shift, there were two crews that worked loading, and they would load the aircraft when they came back. Uh, so the other part of your job was, uh, if you weren't on load crew, they took your load crew and they split you in two, and you would work what they call arm and de-arm. See, when you load a bomb, slow down a rack and you have to put a pin in there just so it's not dropped accidentally and you, you pin the gun so it doesn't fire accidentally on the ground everything all these have to and they have red streamers hanging off them and the red streamers say remove before flight so once you get the aircraft all loaded up it has all these streamers on it and when they go out on a mission they go down to one end of the runway to take off well down there there's a pad well, there's a little little building and it's like a little bunker actually because the end of the runway is the end of the base other than the concertina wire, the minefields, more concertina wire, more minefields and that goes out probably four or five hundred yards. When you worked arm area you would go down there two guys and you'd sit down there for 12 hour shifts and you marshal them up, you'd stop them and then you would go around and you'd pull the pins on all the aircraft. Then you'd, you'd show the pilot the pins and you'd go to the next aircraft and do it. Well, you're sitting at the end of the runway and whether the base was that as big as it was or a small one, they had snipers. During the daytime, they weren't too prominent, but at night they would be because you, you were sitting out there at night, 12 hour shifts at night, and you had orange wands so the, the pilots could see you. And you would marshal them in with the wands. Well, the snipers would see the wands and figure where you're at. And for the, I don't know, they weren't very accurate, but it would scare the daylights out of you when they fired at you. So one guy would go out and do that, and mind you, you're standing exposed. The other guy would sit on top of the bunker with a 
M16, just in case he picked up anybody and he'd fire at them. Sprawling Bien Hoa Air Base, target for Viet Cong rockets, which blast both this base and the smaller Phuc Vinh airstrip, both just north of the capital city of Saigon. At least six Americans killed, 100 wounded. Two U.S. jets destroyed, 25 damaged, millions of dollars property loss. Rockets plastered the base, but it still remained in operation. The bloodiest, most bitter battle of the war so far. Enemy mortars and snipers are blasted by Marine pilots, killing 1,100 Viet Cong. We lost 139, 398 wounded. Later, Marine flyers smashed Cong missile sites in the neutral buffer zone. Worst memory of the war. You know, I, I guess it's just um, the rocket mortar attacks that we would go through. In your mind, you're going over, okay, I'm in, I'm in a war zone, I'm in a war zone, but I'm sitting on this huge base. Uh, and that night we got rocketed and mortared. And you're not used to it, you're, you're sitting there going, wait a minute, this is a huge base. <laughs> and, uh, and I mean, it would go on for 10, 15 minutes and there was nothing you could do about it. And uh, it's, it ended, and I got up right away and went out to see where all the damage had been, because I knew some rounds had hit close by. And it's the worst thing you could do, because we learned later on, and they didn't do it that night, but what they would do is they would purposely lob in 20, 30 rounds. And then they'd wait 10, 15 minutes. Then they'd lob in two or three hundred more because people would go out to see what was hit. I mean, they knew Americans were curious, especially the new ones over there. And I would say that was my worst. To be under a rocket and mortar attack, you have no, I mean, you can't get small enough. The one thing they always told you to watch out for is after a rocket or mortar attack, they said, watch the Vietnamese. Because they said, if you find one that is standing over by a hole and paces off to a building, that's probably VC and you gotta turn them in. Because they were deadly accurate with, I mean, it was amazing. They'd fire, they hit like say, say they would, would shoot and they'd miss a building. The next attack, they would hit that building. I mean, and, and these are rockets and mortars. I mean, mortars are the scary ones. Rockets, they're, you know, they're, they were 122 millimeter rockets. They were like eight feet long, the, the whole rocket. Uh, and they could shoot them 20 miles away. Mortars were closer, uh, but mortars were scarier because they'd walk them right up the base on you. They'd be like, Maybe they'd have three, three of them set up somewhere and they'd start down by the flight line and, and you'd hear them hitting the base and they'd be walking right up toward the torch. And I mean, that is a scary thing because you can't, like I said, you can't get small enough. And they used to have bunkers that you go outside the barracks and go to. They lost more people running to the bunkers than they would if they just stayed put. So you would just, lay on the ground and stay put. Uh, and it was scary on a flight line. When you were working on a flight line, these are covered revetments. Now, the revetments are, they're big arches. The aircraft sits inside it. It's got approximately two feet of concrete on top of steel. And it took that and it, it blew the, the concrete right up. I mean, it, it obliterated that jet. When they would rocket Mortia, it, uh, you talk about a helpless feeling because there's nothing you can do just to sit. I ran into the Vietnamese and, and we were, we'd been drinking quite a bit that night. And, and we said, hey, can you get us a couple girls? He said, yeah, sure, I can get you girls. He said, you know, you want number one girls, I'll get them for you. So we said, okay. And he said, well, he says, I'm going to need some money up front. 
uh, and we said, okay, you know, how much you need? Well, I need, uh, you know, these girls, they're, they're good girls, you know, we're probably going to need about five bucks a piece. You know, well, you got to remember, you know, 71, you know, five dollars was a lot of money, you know, then. So, and he says, and, uh, and he says, and I'm also going to need, he says, I got to get them on base, so I'm going to need a couple of raincoats. So we, we had our blue raincoats, you know, that we we wore. We had the camouflage ones. Well, we said, which ones you, you know? I better, he says, you guys don't ever wear the blue ones. I'll, I'll wear the, the camouflage ones I need to get them on base. They'll look like GIs. So we said, okay, you know. So we gave him the $10, this guy and I, and we gave him $10. We gave him two raincoats. Never saw him again. <laughs> There's certain things I do not talk about from Vietnam. I know I killed people. I never saw them. You do a long distance. I mean, up over the trail, I know I killed people. You never saw them. You know, it's, uh, you know, it, that's what I mean. A gunship would leave, you'd watch it take off, you'd be talking, you know, you'd talk to these guys in the briefing room or something. See you later, okay. No, you wouldn't. You know. Lose two aircraft in, in a matter of a few hours. It's over 28 guys. You know. So it's. Uh, it's not like I picked up a gun and shot anybody and saw it, or had my friend killed right next to me. But you just know they're gone. It was, uh, Kind of surreal because uh, I'd been there 15 months. Most tours were only 12. I went down to the uh, day before I went down from Benoit, rode a, a two and a half, deuce and a half, they call it, down to uh, Tonsonut Air Base. I uh, out processed, ran into some friends that I knew from Benoit. Um, they had been stationed down there. I stayed the night with them in their barracks. And then the next morning I processed at the terminal and uh, got on the Freedom Bird. You land at uh, Travis Air Force Base and you take a bus and you go up to, uh, to LA, Los Angeles Airport, and um, you're in uniform and you're not popular. And I mean, it was, uh, it was not like you get any, you know, it, and that's what I, you know, you carried that for so many years. You know, it wasn't, in, and I, actually this is the truth, it wasn't until the Iraq war that I think that America started to appreciate, you know, the servicemen, you know, or 9-11. Uh, because, uh, I mean, we were actually, I mean, you're in an airport and people are hollering at you, calling your names, and, and I mean, you talk about an impression upon you. You spent 15 months doing what you thought your country wanted you to do. And the Stars and Stripes doesn't cover any bit to tell you about how much protesting there is that you're going to see in LAX when you land. And when you land, you're in for a shock because you sit there and you go, this is not the country I left. You know? and, and you sit there and you go, what, what did I do all this for? I went over there, I spent 15 months of my life, and, uh, and I come back and these people, you know, they didn't spit on me, but they called me names. I got out of the Air Force, and I went from job to job. I was a mechanic one place, and I was a mechanic another place, until I found the fire department, because once again, I was, 
it, it was the adrenaline rush. It's amazing the there was nothing like combat. Nothing like being shot at. Or somebody trying to kill you. That all your senses, I mean, if you're scared, you gotta think. And I found in my life at that time, I love the adrenaline rush. And combat is much like going into a burning building. You're putting your life on the line, and it's you against, you're opposing something that's evil. I decided to take Vet Doc this year because my sister had taken the class last year and she had told me how truly rewarding and amazing the experience is. And I just wanna thank her for pushing me to sign up for the class because without her doing that, I would have never met such an amazing guy with such an amazing story. Batak is a huge family. We all tease, support, and care about each other. And I just wanna thank everybody that's a part of the project who helped me along the way. When I first met Mick, I was unbelievably nervous because I had seen him on a computer screen every single day, but actually meeting and talking with him was so surreal. And he opened up to me and trusted me to tell his story of the service and sacrifices he gave to our country. And I can only hope that I gave his story justice because the nine months I spent working on his doc seems so insignificant compared to the sacrifices and service he gave to our country. Mick has taught me to never take anything for granted and to always give 100%. I know my life will forever be changed from his story and I just wanna say thank you, Mick, for allowing history not only to be taught through books, but through your story. It will never be forgotten. Thank you for making me a better person.